Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot. Please, if you could sit down and um, be as quiet as you can, it'll help our audio situation tremendously. Uh, Mark is going to kick off right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Passio. I want to thank everyone personally for taking the time to be here today. I want to thank Art for doing such a great job setting up the venue. I want to thank his brother Chris for helping out as well. I want to thank Barb for helping out with the table in the back. We have some merchandise back there if you're interested during the day. And I want to thank Richard Grove and his whole team for coming out and filming the presentation today. I just want to uh, go through a little bit of housekeeping before I get started and let people know about the format. Uh, I'll be speaking until uh, 1 o'clock and then we'll take a one hour lunch break from 1 to 2. Uh, there'll be a second session from 2 to 5 p.m. And then at 5 p.m. we'll be taking a second break, a dinner break from 5 to 6. And then we'll have a third session from 6 to about 8, which will hopefully include a question and answer session. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if I, I stay on time with uh, what I want to cover today. My seminar for today is called Demystifying the Occult. And what I really want to do here today is bring occult terminology, occult traditions, and occult symbology into practical application for people and help them understand what these sciences really are and how they're being used today in the world all around them. So before we begin, as I often do with many of my lectures, I want to give a few caveats or things that you should kind of look out for. The first thing here today, and you know, I get this a lot with uh, people who are new to my work. Um, let me just, uh, before I even start this, ask how many people are completely new to my work here today by a show of hands? Okay, just a couple. Okay, so not many who are completely new. How many, would, how many would you say are relatively new? You haven't looked at a lot of my material, but you've seen maybe a few YouTube videos. Okay, a decent bit. How many people would say that they're very familiar with my work to the point of having watched most of my videos or gone through most of my podcasts, if not all of them, by a show of hands? Great, so we have a lot of veterans with my material here today, so to speak. That's good. Well, you know, there's this old saying in uh, ancient philosophy and in occultism in general. It goes, there is nothing new under the sun. A lot of people don't know what this really means, you know. Um, it means that the truth has always been here, is always going to be here. It always has been here around us, you know, whether we've noticed it or not. And, you know, what I'm presenting here today is nothing new. It's not any revolutionary, groundbreaking material. What it is, is it's pattern recognition. It's looking at uh, information and presenting it in a tapestry so that it can be readily understood by people, okay, who have not been familiar with this material before. So um, all I could really do with this material, it's, it's not like I'm inventing anything. I'm just presenting what's already there. All I can really do is present it in a personalized style, my own particular personalized style and aesthetics applied to it, that's all. But for people who are expecting, you know, radically new material here, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, not the, the point of this. The point of this is to bring what's already going on around us in our world to people's attention so that they can understand it more easily. My present presentation style has been described by some people as very intense. I, I consider that fair. I'm an intense person. The truth is intense, okay? Some people will say that I'm combative, and I don't deny that, too, because, like I said, the truth um, is combative by its very nature. The truth is at war with deception. The truth is at war with mind control, all right? The truth is at war with the forces of evil at work in our world. By that very nature, it's belittle, uh, it's um, uh, belligerent. It's a warlike force, truth, you know, if it's wielded properly. If people get angered or upset by some of the comments that I make during the course of the presentation, fine, so be it. 
feel those emotions, let them run through you. But, um, you know, I would say don't let those emotions, if they are, you know, negative or if they are uh, emotions of anger for some of the things that I say, don't let, try not to let that color uh, what you feel about the information that's being presented regarding whether it's true or not, okay? That's called emotional mind control falling into that trap. And, you know, that's, a, that's uh, something that people really need to look out for. I don't present the information that I present or I, I didn't decide to become a public speaker because this is just information I'm interested in or because I like doing this. Okay, uh, I always have to laugh at people, especially in my personal life, who say, Mark, this is just stuff that you're interested in. Okay, I, I tell them, you have to be out of your mind if you think, you know, telling people about that the world is in a state of slavery and mind control is my personal interests, you know? <laughs> so I don't do this uh, with my time because I want to be liked, because I want to be popular, because I want to make friends, or because I want to make money. I don't do it for any of those reasons. I don't really particularly want to do this with my time. I do it because I recognize that in a time of universal deceit and deception that we're living in and universal ignorance that the public is in, that I have a moral obligation to bring this information to public awareness so that humanity can turn uh, the situation around You know, if there's still time left to do so. That's why I do what I do. Um, two other things people should try to do uh, to take full value away from this whole seminar, and that's set your perceptions aside of me as the presenter. Very difficult for some people to do. Some people watch a presentation, they focus on the presenter the whole time. The sound of their voice, the way they dress, their mannerisms, their inflections, okay? Um, you want to try to focus on the information as much as possible, not me. I'm not the important thing here, the information is. And two, be consciously aware, as I've already said, of your own impulses to possibly reject information that I'm gonna present here today based on initial emotional response or reaction to what I'm saying. It is a logical fallacy to gauge the veracity or truthfulness of any information based upon your emotions, how you feel when you first hear it. So you may be upset, you may be a little scared, uh, you know, you have to put those emotions aside and try to gauge the information rationally. It can be very difficult. It's a difficult process, and I recognize fully what I'm asking people to do by making that statement. Another little caveat, this seminar is a tapestry of information. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. It is meant to be taken in as a whole, connected together, okay, in its entirety. To gain the maximum value from this whole seminar, I highly recommend that you stay for the duration of the whole seminar. Otherwise, you will most likely not recognize the patterns inherent to this tapestry, and more likely than not, you'll have wasted your time and money. And I don't want to see that happen with anyone. I want you to take full value away for taking the time to be here today. The scope of the information that I'm presenting here today is so enormous that it could not possibly be conveyed in a time frame measured in multiple years. Probably it couldn't be conveyed in a time frame measured in multiple lifetimes, okay? This is a lifelong study. Um, you could not possibly present the entirety of occult information in one seminar, okay? I couldn't teach that to someone. I, you, I can, you couldn't make the claim I have the entirety of that information, okay? Again, this is a lifelong study. It's, an it's a journey over one's lifetime. And uh, I want people to fully recognize that this material is introductory and rudimentary. You know, I'm not here to speak to lifetime, lifelong occultists who are going super deep into occult information. I'm here to whet the appetite of beginners to try to kind of spark them on their own personal journey of discovery regarding this information. You know, and please recognize I'm also putting this information out there online to people. It's not just for those in the room. It's for people who may be 100% completely new to it who are watching the seminar online. So that's really all the caveats I want to talk about before we get started. Now, my last presentation was called Streetwise Spirituality. What does it truly mean to be awake? 
I gave this um, back in May in St. Louis, Missouri. And it was about a, a, a seven, eight hour presentation, something like that. And in it, I presented um, a framework of 20 factors of what it means to really be awake. And they're all listed here. These were the main points of this seminar. I'm not gonna read every one of them, but I just wanna really say that what this presentation here today is, is it's kind of unpacking the number one factor that I presented in that, in that seminar, Streetwise Spirituality. I said that the number one factor for what it really means to be awake, not this new age hokum, new age perception of what awakening means, but a very practical, feet on the ground, streetwise approach to spirituality. In that framework, what does it mean to be awake? My number one factor in my list of factors for what real awakening means was knowing about the occult and understanding that there are both light and dark aspects to it. When I really thought about all the factors that constituted awakening, and I structured that into a presentation, this was my very, very, very first factor, okay, after I looked at all 20. Because I realized that the thing that people who I consider unconscious or asleep do share in common, almost universally, is that those individuals know nothing about the occult at all. Zero. Zero. You know, the people that I consider not awake, the people that I consider still being manipulated, still at a, operating at a largely unconscious level, all of them share that same factor in common. They don't know about the occult at all. Whether they be people who think it's just a political problem that can be solved by voting, or just electing the right person into office, whether it's people who think it's just a financial problem or we just have to reel in the big banks and the Federal Reserve, you know, whether, uh, you, you know, you name the factor that they blame externally on the conditions that are present for humanity. They leave consciousness at the door. They don't talk about that as an issue. And again, universally, they have no knowledge of the occult. So that's kind of who I really, really am directing this presentation toward here today, is the people who don't have a frame of reference based in knowledge about what the occult is and the knowledge that it contains, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today. So my first section is called, What is the Occult? Uh, I'll actually be presenting uh, this information in, in three basic, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, is it three? It's four basic, um, components, it's four basic sections to this seminar. The first is what is the occult, it's a general overview of occultism and what it is, the knowledge that it contains. The second, present, uh, the second section of the presentation will be occult traditions, and I'll be breaking down in a very rudimentary way because, you know, time doesn't allow to go into any depth, several different occult traditions. The third section of the presentation I'll be breaking down uh, many different occult symbols, some of the more prevalent symbols involved in occult symbology. And then in the last section, uh, more likely than not at the end of the dinner break that we'll be taking, uh, I'll be doing a case study in occult symbolism by presenting some of the uh, very deep, uh, spiritually um, significant symbolism in the major arcana of the tarot deck. And that'll be the last part of the presentation. So the first section again is what is the occult and why should you know about it? Why is it so important to know what the occult really is? You know, people have different ideas of what is meant by the word occult. You know, you say this to some people and they immediately think of an image like this, you know, a conjuration of a demon, okay? You know, and, and I'm not gonna tell you that there aren't specific occult practices that may, you know, involve something like this or people believe uh, you know, that this can be done or attempt to do it or possibly even do it. But, you know, this is like more of a Hollywood variant, you know, a Hollywood conception of what people think of as going on in the occult. You think of, oh, those rebellious teenagers out in the woods with the black robes, with a bonfire lit, sacrificing some animals, okay? Uh, you know, this is a very limited perception of what the occult is, and it's often a a wildly off perception of what it is and what it contains. 
The, the occult is so much more than that, and it's so much more significant than practices like this, which I would consider mystical practices. And I'm gonna talk about mystical practices versus actual occultism, the study of the occult information, all right? So the first thing, let's, before we get into a working definition or a practical definition of occult information or occultism, Let's look at the word occult itself. For people who are familiar with my work, this is nothing new. The word occult is derived from the Latin adjective occultus. Uh, occultus in Latin means hidden from sight, not easily seen. The word occultus in Latin, the adjective in Latin, comes from the Latin verb occultare. Occultare means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. And both of those words in Latin are in turn from derived from the Latin noun oculus. Oculus means eye. So ultimately, occult information is that which is related to vision, to what one is capable of seeing or not capable of seeing. It is hidden information. It is information that is veiled. It is information that is not readily seen by most people. Okay, like an iceberg floating in icy waters. You know, the, the biggest part of the iceberg is often below the surface. You have to penetrate the surface to get at the bulk of the material. And that's the same with occultism. You know, the truth is hidden from view. It's veiled from sight. And you have to penetrate into the depths. You know, you can't just wait in the shallow waters to get this information and to understand it deeply. You have to go into the deep waters to understand it. And that involves going deeply into the self, you know, because that's what ultimately the occult is about. The occult is knowledge. Okay, let's get that straight from Jump Street, okay? We're talking about knowledge here, hidden information. And it's knowledge that is held very tightly by a few people on Earth. It's not widely known. Okay, it's structured knowledge in many cases by different traditions. Okay, it is hierarchically organized in many different traditions. It is compartmentalized by some who want uh, the people who are adherents of this information at lower levels, you know, they don't want them to understand the entire tapestry for many different reasons. Okay, so compartmentalization and hierarchy play a role in different occult organizations. When it comes to the structuring of this information, you have to look at it like that hierarchical and compartmentalized pyramid structure pictured there. You know, the bottom levels represent the people who have the least amount of knowledge and the least amount of knowledge about how all of that information fits together in a tapestry. With, as you go higher up in the, you know, hierarchical structure, there's fewer and fewer people, but the knowledge becomes concentrated. It, it operates at a higher level, and they see how it's all connected together. And those people want to keep that, their position in that structure. Because again, a differential in knowledge is a differential in power. If you keep people ignorant of what you know and how it all fits together and how it all interoperates and correlates with all of the other information in that, in that data set, in that body of knowledge, then you're in a position to completely manipulate those below you. And this is how much of the occult works, particularly dark occultism, which we'll be talking about. The th key point to keep in mind here is that the occult is hidden knowledge. And that's all it means, okay? It doesn't mean bad, it doesn't mean evil, it doesn't mean negative, it doesn't mean Satanism, voodoo, or any other specific occult practices. The occult is a generalized term, generalized terminology for hidden knowledge, for knowledge which has been hidden from people's view. So hey, could that include sciences that people don't really understand, you know, about how energy works in the universe, you know, how we could gain uh, energy from, uh, you know, different methodologies other than internal combustion engines or burning fuel or, you know, things like that. Sure, it contains that. What about knowledge of, uh, you know, different kinds of propulsion systems that people see when they see UFO sightings? The, it, it, are we talking about the occult there? Are we talking about the occult when we talk about ghost sightings and, you know, possible other dimensions of being? It's, it's all contained in there. All of those things are occult knowledge. You know, it's not just one thing. It's hidden knowledge that is hidden for a spe specific reason, and that's to create a power differential. 
between people who understand it and those who don't. When we get into talking about occultism, we have to understand the difference between these two terms, exoteric and esoteric. Exoteric means something that is intended for or likely to be understood by the general public. Okay, it's common knowledge, exoteric knowledge or exoteric wisdom. All right, it's current or popular among the general public. The general public is comfortable with it, okay? The word exoteric comes from the Greek adjective exoterikos. Exoterikos in Greek means external or outside of. So you're not in the inner circle if you're in the exoteric realm. This is the realm of knowledge that is taught to the general population because they don't want people getting at the bullseye. Okay, you look at this as a dartboard or something to that effect, you know. The core of truth lies at the very center at the bullseye. That's what we ultimately want to get to if we're going to transform ourselves and transform our society for the better. The exoteric realm is that which is fed to the great hordes of unwashed masses. You know, simple explanations, unidimensional worldviews and explanations for things. And when we penetrate that you know, next layer, we get into the occult traditions, the esoteric sciences that get us closer to the very core, to the heart of truth. The esoteric is information which is intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with specialized knowledge or interest, okay? It requires desire for it. You have to want it. You have to be interested enough to want it. You have to care enough to want to take it in. The esoteric is that which is hidden or occulted. It is mysterious. It is beyond the range of ordinary knowledge, experience, or perception. It is that which is communicated only to the initiated. The initiated means those who have begun. Okay, I, I tell people about my former involvement in the dark occult. And these dark occultists called the average human being one of the very strange terms that they called the average person is the unbegun, which I didn't even understand what it meant when they said it to me repeatedly. The, the, the higher knowledgeable people in the dark occult would use this term, not the lower down minions, okay? It was something that was used by people who directed a lot of these occult groups that I was involved in, these dark occult organizations. And, you know, again, I, had no, I, I didn't understand what they meant by that until long after I had completely you know, ceased my involvement with those groups. The unbegun, it means those who have not started at all. You know, they're still at a zero level of knowledge when it comes to occult information. So what this whole seminar constitutes is a process of initiation. It is helping people to get started, to begin. You know, and that's why my first section was before we begin, you know. It's prior to the initiation process, you know, and then delving into the occult for the first time is a process of initiation. And I ask people all the time, where do you see researchers who are presenting simplified rudimentary information about occultism in general? You know, you could see people who break down occult symbolism and talk about the occult in general, but where do you see people really talking about what occult information is, what it contains, why it's important to understand, and break it down in a simple and practical way? It's a very rare thing. There's very few people who are willing to come forward and do that for whatever their reasons are for wanting to maintain their secrecy. But um, to go back to this, the esoteric realm, uh, th that word esoteric comes from the Greek adjective esoterikos, which means within or on the inside of, okay? So that's what we're really talking about. We're in the inner circle now when we penetrate that veil of the exoteric explanations, and we're getting closer to the, the hardcore information, the, closer to that core of truth that we really want to be at. How is occultism different from mysticism? People will often think that these two things are completely the same and the terms can be used interchangeably. But I would say mysticism is a lower level of knowledge or experience or practice than true occultism, than a, a person who truly understands the occult. Mysticism, 
as a term is derived from the Greek verb muo, the first part of mystic or mysticism. The verb muo in Greek means to conceal, similar to the Latin occultare. Mysticism is a loosely defined set of practices, beliefs, traditions, and experiences aimed at human transformation, evolution, and union with the divine. Most forms of mysticism, especially those practiced in modern times, constitute what I would definitely consider an exoteric pathway, which often de-emphasizes knowledge and places large emphasis on emotion, intuition, internal experiences, faith, and perception, much like religion does. This is the main way that mysticism differs from occultism, which conversely comprises a set of esoteric traditions focused on objective knowledge of natural law and the alignment of thought, emotion, and action, resulting in true intelligence, true care, and true will being born within the individual. Okay, We're talking about the actual awakening of the aspects of consciousness and aligning them all in harmony with each other. This is the goal of true occultism, all right? It is the alignment of intelligence, holistic intelligence, okay? Logical and intuitive combined. True care, the desire for truth, okay? Not just everyday mundane cares, okay? Care with a capital C, as I call it and true will, alignment with the will of creation, alignment with the force that expands consciousness, which is love, energy, alignment with freedom, and aligning our behaviors to putting our behaviors into practical action toward true freedom. That's the true will. This is what the goals of real occultism are. You know, whereas mysticism often serves the self, you know, mystics, you know, get into things like just meditative practices because they want to be more productive. They get into fortune telling, you know, because they want to uh, provide services to other people perhaps for, you know, um, monetary value. All kinds of different motivations drive mystical thought. People wanting simply to gain a leg up over their fellow man by certain knowledge or practices. Okay, or just improve upon themselves. Um, the occult encompasses a lot more than that because real, positive, true, light occultism has, again, a deep, objective knowledge of natural law principles at its foundation and the alignment of the aspects of consciousness as its goal. Okay? So that's how I would define the difference between these sets of practices. I would say that mysticism is an exoteric religion. It's, it's like religious practices or beliefs. Whereas occultism is a body of science. It's a body of objective knowledge that represents esoteric sciences. Okay, I hope that makes the difference clear in most people's minds. Going back to what the occult actually is, I'd like to read a quote by the occultist and Freemason C.W. Leadbeater from 1913. He said, how shall we define occultism? And this is his definition, which I think is a pretty good one. The word is derived from the Latin occultus, meaning hidden, so that it is the study of the hidden laws of nature. Since all the great laws of nature are in fact working in the invisible world, far more than in the visible world, Occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider view of nature than that which is ordinarily taken. The occultist, then, is a man or woman who studies all the laws of nature that he or she can reach or of which he or she can hear. And as a result of his or her study, he she identifies him herself with the laws and with these laws of nature and devotes their life to the service of human evolution. That is what occultism is. It's understanding the laws of nature and our connection to them. 
the self's connection to them. Okay, and as a result, we are aligning all of our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions toward the goal of the evolution, not only of our individuated self, but the evolution of all beings. Okay, that's the goal of the occult and occultism in general. So this is my personal working definition of the occult. When I use the word the occult, this is what I mean by it, when I use the phrase the occult. The occult is a body of science which is not widely known to the general population, consisting of hidden knowledge about the workings of the human psyche and the laws of nature, both the seen laws, meaning the physical laws, the physical sciences, and the unseen laws, meaning the spiritual laws, the laws that govern morality, the laws that govern behavioral consequence, okay? That is my working definition of what the occult and occultism is in general. And I think it's a pretty simple, practical working definition. <clears throat> so when we're talking about hidden knowledge or occulted knowledge, what knowledge does occultism hide? What kind of knowledge are we actually talking about? Occultism comprises and quote unquote hides two bodies of knowledge. Now I put hides in quotes because I just want to make a point here. We can't even look at it such that dark occultists, which I'm going to explain their motivations in a future slide, we can't look at it as the beings who want to keep this information back from people actually try to eradicate it and keep it out of people's hands. That's really not what they do, particularly in the modern world. Their main method of manipulation is dissuasion. They try to dissuade people from looking into these bodies of knowledge by telling them there's nothing to see here, move along. Okay, back to bed, nothing to see here, folks. If that's not important or that's not practical. That can't be used in your everyday life. It's of no benefit to you personally, practically, in your life to learn about that. Okay, or it's some quaint religious belief that has no bearing on anything that was just made up by people a long time ago and it's all nonsense. You know, that's the main method of dissuasion that is employed, okay? And most people fall for it. Most people just, you know, think there's nothing to any of this. I don't need to know about it. That's one of the, the heights of ignorance is the phrase, I don't need to know about that, okay? Now just think about that statement right there. The first, the, the highest height of ignorance is, you know, the pinnacle of all ignorance is, I don't want to know about that. Yeah. I don't care to know about that. But the people who think they have it figured out say, that's not something I need to know about. You know, what do I need to look into that for? And that's how you know they're gotten. They're already owned. Lock, stock, and barrel. And most people are in that position because they think, you know, oh, all of this is just hokum. All of this is just religion. And I tried to explain to somebody who's very concerned about the, the political degradation and the political process and the direction America and the world in general is headed, politically and financially. And I tried to explain, you know, what really drives this underneath is the occult. Religion drives this. Religious beliefs by the people involved in dark occultism and their religious belief systems is ultimately what's driving the slavery system on earth. And he says to me, I don't need to know anything about that. I don't want to know anything about that. I said, oh, really? That's something you don't need to learn, you don't need to know about. He said, yeah, that's right, because I don't believe in any of that stuff. And I said, you're gotten. Right to them. They already have you and you don't even understand, you know? Because he said, that's somebody else's belief. How does that affect me? As if somebody else's beliefs can't affect us. And we're immune to what other people believe because particularly religious zealots and people who have very deep-seated belief systems based on faith and religion, right? They don't take action in the world based on those religious beliefs, do they? Never. 
They never do. And those actions would never affect anybody else living in the world. You're completely insulated from those behaviors. You know, it's a child's view. You know, I just have, I, at, at some point with someone like that, I have to set it down and say, you think you're fine? Well, then go be fine. You know, at that point. Because th that's a deep, hardcore level of ignorance to be in. Again, that, that's not really surpassed by much of anything in the way of ignorance, which is something we're going to talk about, the, the different kinds of ignorance. But to go back to what knowledge occultism actually is comprised of, the bodies of knowledge, the two main bodies of knowledge are knowledge of the self and knowledge of the laws of nature. That's basically it. The knowledge of the self, the knowledge of the human psyche and how the psyche operates, its components, its aspects, its motivations, its desires, etc. You know, what drives us? What's going on at a subconscious level? What's going on at the unseen level? You know, in the recesses of the human psyche, in the psychological realms. This is what is known as the minor knowledge of the occult. The minor arcana. Arcana is a Greek word that means knowledge. Okay? I have a Latin word that means knowledge. Um, I tell people don't look at this because it's called the minor arcana or the lesser arcana as meaning of lesser importance. That is not what it means. It's just distinguishing it from uh, that which is larger in scope as far as the kind of systems that it actually affects or that it governs. Okay, so you want to look at the part there on the left as this is the, the small scope of things, the scope of things operating at the individual level, at the individuated domain of the, of the individual self. And then on, on the right-hand side here, you want to look at the major or greater arcana as simply being that which deals with the macrocosmic world, the world of large things, large systems of nature, okay? The physical laws that you know, deal with uh, dynamics and motion and gravity, etc. You know, all of the physical dynamics, electromagnetism, etc. But then the major or greater arcana, the world of macrocosmic knowledge, also includes the knowledge of what I call natural law, the moral laws that govern the consequences of behavior of beings that have the capacity for holistic intelligence, or in other words, universal moral law, the laws that govern consciousness. These are the two bodies of knowledge that comprise all occult knowledge. And I ask people when I explain to them the two bodies of knowledge, what is not contained within these two groups? What knowledge that is of any significance, except you know the football and baseball stats, okay, is of any significance in, in the realm of human life? I would say if you control these two bodies of knowledge, and you're trying to dissuade people from looking into them, then you have people manipulated from the get-go. You know, they don't have a chance if they don't understand these things. And it's the same thing like in the ancient priest classes that wanted to control the population. The, 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 the priest king would go up to the top of the pyramid and tell people, hey, the, 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 uh, the great sky beast is getting ready to eat the sun, and it was an eclipse, you know, it was a solar eclipse. And he's going to eat the earth next if you don't bow down and give me total power. You know, and if, you, if you, know, you accept me as the intermediary between the gods and yourself, then you know, in a few minutes uh, the sun will come back and you know, life will continue on earth. And it worked beautifully because these people had no knowledge of the macroscopic laws of nature. They didn't understand the physical sciences and astronomy in particular back then. You know, they didn't, they didn't understand how that motion worked and how that phenomenon worked. So that's how um, a differential in power can be created when you have a differential in knowledge present. A major point to keep in mind, and this is something people constantly take a unidimensional viewpoint regarding. So many people want to say, oh, all the occult is bad. It's knowledge, folks. It's not something that is universally good or universally evil. 
It's knowledge and what we do with it. That's it. It's a tool. It's a tool set. It's, it's a, would you say astronomy is good or evil? Would you say mathematics is good or evil? Would you say biology is good or evil? It's knowledge. That's all the occult is. It's knowledge. The consciousness of the wielder of that knowledge determine whether it's used for good or evil. You know, so if I'm trying to create genetically engineered food products so I could sell people poison to undermine their health just so I could make more money because I could grow more crops on less land, I'd say that's a pretty dastardly use of science, in my opinion, in my worldview. You know, but science of biology and genetics is just knowledge. What we then do with them determines whether it's good or bad. The same for the occult, and that's how we have to look at it. The occult is a double-edged blade, however. There is, again, a light side to it and a dark side to it. And it's all dependent on how that knowledge is used. So the knowledge contained within the occult sciences can be used for good, which I consider the uplift of consciousness, or it can be used for evil, the manipulation of consciousness, the control of people, and ultimately putting people into bondage and slavery. To clearly distinguish between these different usages of occult knowledge, I refer to occult knowledge that is employed toward the expansion of human consciousness and morality as light occultism or magic. Now some people won't make this distinction. They'll say it's all one body of information, I'm gonna just group it all in. And it's a very dangerous proposition because those people, again, take a very unidimensional approach and they usually take the approach it's all bad and therefore none of it should be looked into. You know, religious people take this approach. It's why they don't understand the occult. Many New Agers take this approach. And they say, if it's not pure spiritualism or pure spiritual mysticism, then I don't want anything to do with it. I consider that's dark stuff or sorcery. It's a very unidimensional and naive and childish view of this body of science. Okay? So uh, that's what I call light occultism. When you use this hidden knowledge toward the uplift of humanity, toward the expansion of consciousness and the expansion of morality... So the other way of using it is for manipulation, control, and the suppression of consciousness. And if the, this knowledge is used in that methodology, then I refer to it as dark occultism or sorcery is a perfectly acceptable term for it. Thus, the practitioners of light occultism could be referred to as light occultists, magicians, magi, light builders, or light workers all terms that I feel could be used interchangeably as long as we're looking at it within the context of occult knowledge as I have defined it in my working definition. And you could look at the practitioners of dark occultism as dark occultists, sorcerers, dark builders, or dark workers, all terms that I feel are perfectly acceptable and interchangeable with each other. So why has such knowledge been hidden from humanity? Well, let's look at, we'll look at why each set of occultists hide this information. Okay, first let's look at why dark occultists hide it, then at a later point we'll look at why even light occultists sometimes conceal this knowledge. Dark occultists have deliberately hidden occult knowledge in order to create and maintain a power differential between those who hold such knowledge and those who are ignorant of it. We've already been talking about that. And if through this mechanism, all power ultimately flows to them because knowledge applied is power in the world. Knowledge is not itself power, it is the potential for power. When you apply knowledge, then you can gain power. If you don't have it, you're completely disempowered from the very beginning. Dark occultists work through fear and manipulation to bring about compliance with their own selfish will. And that's what I would consider the dark arts in general. 
I would consider sorcery the act of um, uh, applying knowledge in order to bring about manipulation in other people so that they comply with your selfish will, what you want for you only, not for the uplift of all. Dark occultists' work is always done in secrecy. They don't want to do their works in the light of day where everyone can know what they're doing. They're constantly contravening the freedom and prosperity of all but themselves, of course. That's the out of control ego run amok. The pure left brain you know, modality of consciousness without the balance of the sacred feminine, compassionate, creative right brain. I consider this pyramidal, hierarchical, and compartmentalized structure the occult structure of our entire world. Dark occultists have completely infiltrated and permeated all institutional walks of life on earth. This is a topic I constantly talk about in my work on my radio show, my podcast series, and in the interviews that I do. It's so important for people to understand this is who's really running the show here on earth. You know, it's not just the international bankers. It, it is them, but they're dark occultists at the highest levels. You know, the people involved in um, the political think tanks are dark occultists at the highest levels. The people involved in, you know, corporatism and business at the very highest levels use these sciences and this knowledge. You know, the high-level religionists in all religion, all ostensible religions, guaranteed they have this knowledge at the highest levels and they're using it for dark purposes. You know, people want to think, oh, that's not happening in my religion. You know, that's going on in all the other religions, but mine is completely pure and free of any wrongdoing. Yeah. Through their manipulation of these institutions, dark occultists currently hold the overall mindset of the human population in a general state of unconsciousness, thus holding humanity in a state of slavery. They have the hordes of humanity in thrall. Okay? They are completely at their mercy at this point because of the amount of knowledge that they lack. Not only regarding what the occult is in general, but regarding the multifaceted, array of mind control methodologies that are being used against them on a daily basis, that they're being barraged with. And um, until we level that playing field through knowledge, don't expect it to change. The thing that the two states that dark occultism wants to hold the overall population is in is what I call the mental schism and the worldview schism. Okay, they want to hold people in a state of chronic, imbalanced thought. <coughs> and then they want to hold people in a chronically imbalanced overall worldview regarding human nature and life in general. If they can keep people in those modes of consciousness, they can keep their control over their behavior because they have control over their mind as a result. So the mental schism works through mind control methods, all the multifaceted soft mind control techniques that I covered over the course of about a year and a half on my radio shows. And in general, how it works is keeping people chronically imbalanced toward one type of consciousness or another, one type of brain activity or another, either the masculine left brain modality of, of consciousness or the feminine right brain modality of consciousness, but never actually holistically bringing them both together in a state of balance. They want it in a chronic state of imbalance, such, as, such that most people are either always, always left brain or always right brain. If the left brain, the masculine component of the brain, the intellect, uh, depicted here by the upward pointing triangle, which is an ancient archetypal symbol known as the blade, representing masculine energy, a rudimentary phallic symbol archetypally. 
If that part of the brain, that left hemisphere, is chronically dominant in an individual, the following states can manifest within that individual. Rigid skepticism or scientism. Atheism. And by atheism, I simply mean the belief that there is no higher power than mankind, than humanity, that we're, we're the pinnacle, we're the, the, the highest force in nature. Nothing ultimately governs humanity except the laws that we arbitrarily make up in this farce called government. Okay? So um, it can create rigid skepticism, scientism, atheism, solipsism, the notion that there is no such thing as actual objective truth that can truly be known. You, uh, social Darwinism, moral relativism. Moral relativism, relativism is the belief that there's no such thing as right and wrong objectively, that these are just arbitrarily chosen concepts and man gets to make up what's right or make up what's wrong. Social Darwinism, the idea that you know, since man is the highest uh, pinnacle of, uh, of uh, mind, uh, the highest animal in nature, that uh, those who are somehow um, gifted with better genetics and a higher intellect should somehow rule over those who they consider beneath them or at some kind of a lower caste than them. And society naturally should be structured like that uh, with an elite class ruling over uh, a class of slaves, basically. Eugenics, the notion that you know, certain people's gene sets should pro propagate themselves, be allowed to propagate, where, uh, and they should control uh, what gene pools should be allowed to propagate. You know, as the intellectual and genetic elite, then they want to uh, control who gets to breed and who does not get to breed. Essentially, who lives and who dies. Authoritarianism, of course, this belief in authority, this illusion that some people are masters and others are slaves, you know, and um, the masters get to issue commands and the slaves have some sort of a inherent moral obligation to obey these commands. It's what I call master think, ultimately. And, you know, that's why they want to create this schism. You know, it's a divide and conquer strategy. It's a very structured arch, you could look at it, where these two forces, you know, combine and lean against each other. Left brain imbalance leans against right brain imbalance, creating a very rigid structure which is difficult to disassemble and take down because these forces play on each other. A right brain imbalance or feminine imbalance, um, the right hemisphere of the brain, which governs creativity, intuition, compassion, nurturing, etc. If that part of the brain that is depicted here by the symbol, the inverted equilateral triangle, which again is an ancient archetypal symbol known as the chalice because it is a rudimentary womb. Um, if, um, if that part of the brain is chronically imbalanced or chronically dominant, I should say, uh, this, these following states result. Naivete, blind belief, religious extremism, you know, total belief, total faith, not actually checking anything, not looking into things for oneself, taking other people's word on it. Solipsism, again, the belief that there's no such thing as truth. Both forms of mental imbalance can create that state. Moral relativism, you see so much moral relativism in the New Age movement. You think moral relativism is the exclusive domain of left brain imbalance, think again because people in the New Age movement are super right brain imbalanced in many cases, and you'll hear many of them saying, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Those are religious concepts. I don't believe in those. So uh, a right brain state of imbalance can lead to the belief that there's no such thing as objective right and wrong as well. Feelings of unworthiness, feelings of self-loathing, falling into patterns of following other people's orders because, hey, if you're naive, if you blindly believe, and you don't really believe there's such a thing as absolute objective truth, then I'm gonna take somebody else's word for it. And if they say this is what's right to do, then I'm just gonna go along, follow their orders. So many people are in that <coughs> extremely imbalanced, dangerous state of mind. And I call this, all of this uh, imbalanced thought slave think in general. And that's what the dark occult 
overlords right now at our time in history. That's what they want. They want these two states. They just want them operating all over society. They don't want anybody in a state of balance coming, bring, bridging these two um, modalities of consciousness and bringing them together. They want people in one state of imbalance or the other so that those dynamics of master, master think and slave think continually play off against each other. The second imbalanced mind state that dark occultism wants to maintain. Again, what I'm talking about here is their great work, okay? The dark occultist's great work. We're talking about what their goal is. What are they trying to constantly maintain in humanity? And they're doing a very effective job of it. They are successful because they operate on the same page for the same goal like one huge mind. They call it a master mind. They focus their energy on that intent. They carry it out in the world through their methodologies. They get it done. That's why we're so scattered. We can't come together with that same master mind focus, that coming together and operating on the same page because we share collective common knowledge. That's what they're doing. They have this knowledge and they use it for dark purposes, all on the same page, all focused, all together for the same goal. And the, the, these two things are their goal, the mental schism and the worldview schism. The worldview schism is this notion that the world is either completely random or completely determined. They want these two schisms of worldview present because they don't want people to understand the balance that is the actual truth that there is components within nature of both of these views of reality, but they operate in conjunction with each other, not in a state of imbalance. They operate in a state of true balance with each other. I'll explain that in a moment. Let's look at the states of imbalance that the dark occult wants to maintain. This, the notion or worldview of randomness is a very left brain imbalanced worldview. It contains notions such as the universe is a grand accident. Okay? Everything just is accidental that has happened. There's no purpose. There's no underlying purpose for anything. We're living in a random, accidental realm that happened for no true reason or purpose. Uh, they believe that people who subscribe to the randomness worldview believe there's no creator and therefore there is no underlying intelligence in nature. You know, everything is reductionist and a dead thing. You know, the cell is dead, there's no such thing as consciousness, the earth is dead, the solar system's dead, the sun is just a big uh, ball of, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen and helium having a sustained fusion reaction. But it's a dead thing. Um, Random this worldview often postulates that there's no such thing as spiritual or moral or natural law. Because hey, if the universe is a dead thing, came into reality for no real purpose, it's a purple, purposeness clockwork mechanism operating only by matter, okay? Then, you know, there can't be any such thing as actual morality and laws that govern our decisions, whether our decisions are based in right or wrong. Uh, the belief that existence has no purpose other than to con continue to exist. Survival mentality, pure survival mentality. Nothing wrong with the concept of preparedness or survival, especially in the kind of times we're living in today. But uh, to believe that existence itself exists for no other reason than to survive is very left brain imbalanced. And randomness is the general hallmarks of scientism, atheism, and just about every totalitarian culture that has ever existed on this planet. Conversely, the deterministic worldview holds notions such as God controls every event in creation. This is a very right brain imbalanced worldview. You know, there's uh, no, per, there's, everything is preordained, you know. Free will it doesn't even enter into the picture. It's an illusion, it doesn't really exist. I, I hear so many New Agers constantly say, there's no such thing as free will, free will is an illusion. 
you know, at an ultimate level, it's an illusion. Very, very dangerous proposition, very dangerous belief that we don't have free will. You know, that starts to excuse people for immoral behavior. Determinism often postulates, hey, since the whole universe is controlled and it's like a clockwork me mechanism, but it's run by God, um, why bother trying to create any change? Change is impossible. It's already set in stone. Action, therefore, becomes ultimately meaningless. Why do anything? I tell religionists who think like this, why do you get out of bed in the morning? You know, why bother doing anything? Why say a word to another human being? Why eat? Why breathe? You know, why not just lay in a, in, a, in, a, in a supine position in the corner somewhere and wait to expire from malnutrition and, and dehydration and then go back to dust? You know? But uh, you know, many people, they actually say that this is what they believe. You know? it's, a big, it's a big hallmark of salvationist uh, religiosity you know, that action is meaningless. Only faith is what's required, something that I'm vehemently opposed to. You know, and the New Age takes this in, too. You know, they, they, they convert it in their own imbalanced way. That, um, you know, we're, we're here just to observe, you know. Don't get involved in anything. Just observe it. Watch it. Be the observer. You know, life's not a movie playing on a screen in front of your eyes. Folks, you're active participants, whether you realize that or not. Again, this right brain imbalance and this whole worldview of determinism are the, is the hallmark of religious extremism and what I call slave think. The truth lies as it always does in the balance point, okay, in the synthesis, in the coming together between extremes in many cases. And that is often extreme in itself because so few people are in that balance point, truly. The truth is that the actual way that the universe operates is through two overarching mechanisms, a deterministic component to creation and a randomness component to creation. The deterministic component is natural law which I delved into in the seminar in Connecticut last year. And again, that's the work that I highly recommend people to deeply, deeply know for people who haven't, you know, who've only touched on some of my work and you know, may not be familiar with my natural law material. It is the most important work that I've put forward and I highly recommend to people to watch my natural law seminar in its entirety uh, multiple times if you have to, to drive the information home. Um, so natural law is the deterministic component of creation. The moral laws that govern the consequences of our behavioral decisions, the laws, those laws themselves are set in stone and cannot be changed. They are the deterministic component to nature. And then there is a free will component to nature, which beings with the capacity for holistic intelligence have been gifted with by creation itself. That is the force of free will. That's why that can never be dismissed. And it works in tandem with the laws of nature to bring us the results of our choices into our experience so that we can learn and grow from those choices and those experiences. This is the worldview that the dark occult wants to keep people from which is why I embodied it by the all-seeing eye. That's, what, that's a big part of enlightenment, what real enlightenment is about. And I talk about that as well in my Streetwise Spirituality seminar. Another thing that dark occultists want to prevent people from understanding is how our reality is actually built. How we, Together, in the aggregate, in aggregate numbers, meaning collectively as a species, co-create our reality that we are experiencing on the earth together as a people. You, know, you hear this notion in the New Age movement, the law of attraction. You know, that a lot of the New Age people want people to believe we're individually creating our reality all by ourselves. Mark Passio does not create Mark Passio's reality 
entirely what I experience by myself, by how I think. Other people are involved in that process. It's a co-creative process. Okay? Because if someone randomly does something violent to me, I did not create that experience. This is a total misunderstanding of the law of attraction, how the law of attraction works. All right, free will is involved. I can do something completely random. So can other people, because they have the capacity for free will behavior. So we're not creating our reality individually, at an individuated level. Based upon the knowledge that we take in, based upon our understanding of that knowledge, and then based upon what we do in our behaviors with that knowledge, in the aggregate numbers, determines how a society is creating its reality for itself. It happens on a societal scale. So dark occultists know how this principle operates. And that's why there's the level they always want to control reality from. That's the level of reality that if you're a dark occultist that you want to get to, that you want to poison the stream of, that you want to limit access to, that you want to dissuade people from looking into. It's the knowledge itself. What I'm going to build here in this slide is actually the trivium. It's the ancient trivium methodology of truth discovery, which I also broke down in my natural law seminar. It's called knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. In the modern trivium, it's referred to as grammar, logic, and rhetoric. There's also what I call a computer analogy model of the trivium, which is input, processing, and output. But they're all ultimately the same thing. So this is the grammar or input step of the trivium method. It's taking in all the seemingly disparate pieces of information that are out there. You're gathering your grammar. You're gathering your different pieces of your vocabulary. Available information constitutes potential knowledge that we can gather, that we can process, that we can come to understand, and then that we can act upon. If we don't do that, we have ignorance. We haven't even looked at it. So the opposite of knowledge is total ignorance. You haven't even begun looking into it. The second level of how our reality is built, is it's built atop knowledge. On top of that knowledge as a foundation, you either have a grasp or an understanding of those principles, or you do not. So you either learn what that knowledge means and how it works, or you don't have a, a deep understanding of that. So these are decision-making, filtering processes. This is the uh, logic step of the trivium. Or in the computing analogy model, this would be the processing step. These processes take place in the human mind and are chosen by each individual based upon the available information that they have taken in. So if you haven't done your grammar or you haven't aggregated your knowledge in step number one of this process, you can't possibly do the processing and come to an understanding of it. It's why so many people have no understanding of the principles of the occult sciences because they haven't even started beginning to learn what the occult is or what it contains. So you can't possibly arrive at an understanding of how the universe works if you haven't gathered that knowledge. Then the third step in this process is acting, actually taking action based upon your understanding. Each individual in a society, each individual's behavior is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes that they exercise in step number two, which in turn were based on the quality of the available information which they took in. Now, now again, notice, wisdom is action. It's different than knowledge. It's different than understanding. All right? These, knowledge is something that exists inherently, and you can take it in objectively. Understanding is an internal process that goes on within the self based upon the knowledge that you've taken in and processed. And then wisdom is action. It's what you do in the world with the knowledge that you have accrued and understood. So again, I, I put here, or lack thereof in every one of these blocks, 
The lack of knowledge is ignorance. The lack of understanding is confusion. And the lack of wisdom is folly. So one more level above that is what we get based upon what we've done. What is manifested? What is generated? What do we experience? The manifested reality. It's the quality of the conditions that we experience. And the quality of the condition which manifests collectively in our society, in any society, is based upon the aggregate quality of behavior within that society. So again, it's a stepwise progression. What we've taken in, what we've come to understand, how we behave, what we get. I tell people this is the most powerful slide in all my work. If you understand one slide, deeply, deeply understand this process. Because this is what the dark occultists do not want people to understand. That's the real law of attraction, folks. Not the New Age variant of it. Not the New Age hokum mysticism. I want to sell a million, billion books telling people what they want to hear, law of attraction. Okay? This is how the universe actually works inherently. And it describes not only how it works, but our relationship to that process. And this is what they don't want you to know. That's the most deeply hidden information. Because natural law is contained within that. Because as the aggregate quality of behavior is immoral, slavery is the manifestation. That's why we're at where we are at. Because so many people aren't truly moral individuals. They don't really deeply know the difference between right and wrong behavior and choose the right over the wrong. So as long as they can keep that back from the bulk of humanity, from deeply understanding, there's always going to, they're always going to be in control. Until this becomes common knowledge of how the universe really works and how our experience is really generated. And we understand as in the aggregate we become more and more moral of a civilization, then our civilization becomes more free as we become more moral. When we understand how those governing dynamics bring to us the overall quality of our aggregate experience, that's when we're making progress as a species. That's when we're breaking out of mind control. And that's when we're countering the dark occultists' great work. Now, why do light occultists hide occult knowledge? Because they do. Light occultists also hide occult knowledge. Light occultists have hidden occult knowledge in order to prevent its complete eradication during exceeding draconian times. And at other times, they have hidden that knowledge to prevent it from falling into the hands of would-be dark occultists in other words, those who knew of the empowerment that could be gained from such knowledge, but who wanted to use it for immoral purposes or for purposes of manipulation and control. Occasionally, at times in history, those who consider themselves or others have considered light occultists have sequestered certain occult knowledge for these purposes. And again, if it's strictly for those purposes, I would not fully condemn that. However, at certain stages in history, like the one we're in now, where this information could be brought forward without immediately being you know, burned at the stake or something like that, or tortured in a horrific way, I do not agree with hiding it even for these purposes. Could there be a would-be dark occultist in this audience? Yes, possibly. You know, I, I gave a lecture one time at uh, a food market in Philadelphia, and there were some teenage children around the age of 17 or 18 in the audience who wanted to know all about the occult symbolism that I was going to talk about because they actually wanted to use it for manipulative purposes. They wanted to learn about the archetypal ways that symbolism could be used and somebody who knew them told me this, that that was why they came. And I said, hey, let, let them understand it. Because if 
everybody understands it, the playing field is leveled. Then nobody can use it for those dark purposes because you're empowered by knowledge. And if you see how they're using it, you say, oh, I know how that's being used. That's not going to have an effect on me. It's like gun ownership. It's the same thing. I want everybody to own guns because the only way you're ever going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You know, as long as guns exist in, in, the, in the natural world, that's the reality of the situation, whether anybody likes it or not. Get as offended about it as you want. You know, so it levels the playing field. When you want to take something away from one group of people and only have it in the hands of the other group of people, there's a huge imbalance in power. So I'm for egalitarianism when it comes to natural rights and when it comes to the dissemination of knowledge. Everybody should be on equal footing as to their ability to take in what they desire to take in. And in that sense, nothing sh no knowledge should be sequestered. The great work of light occultists, in stark contrast to the great work of dark occultists, which we've been talking about, is the distribution of occult knowledge freely to humanity thereby ending the slavery of humanity by eliminating the widespread ignorance which dark occultists exploit to gain and maintain their control. Light occultists would be better referred to as de-occultists, which is a term I absolutely love and I consider myself. I, I, don't even, I don't even want anybody to call me a light occultist or an occultist in general. I like to be called a de-occultist. That's my task, that's my work to break this knowledge out like an avalanche onto humanity and just let it flow freely where it will so that people can take it in and we can level the playing field that has thus far been dominated by ignorance. So light occultists I feel would be better referred to as de-occultists because what de-occultists do is reveal and spread knowledge which has been hidden and which must be known commonly known. It must become common knowledge in order for freedom to manifest. Is the occult really hidden? Really hidden? Again, it's what I was talking about when I said, do they really hide it or do they just dissuade people from looking into it? Is this knowledge truly inaccessible and completely hidden or is it out there for anyone who wants it? Well, I would make the argument it's out there for anyone who wants it. I mean, we're drowning in information. If anything, it's become a little bit more difficult to even get the information because of how much nonsense you often have to weed through to get the real material. You know, it, it's covered by a, a, the signal is often covered by noise, you could say. But are we living in a nescient society or an ignorant society? And this uh, involves the understanding of the difference between two connotative forms of not knowing something. I call this the context of not knowing, nescience versus ignorance. Most people have not heard the word nescience. It's a uh, fairly antiquated word, not used much in colloquial English these days. Nescience comes from the Latin verb nesciere. Nesciere in Latin means to not know because knowledge was absent or unattainable. Well, is the knowledge of the occult completely absent? Is it totally unattainable? Can we not understand it because we don't have access to the knowledge? We don't have access to that baseline level in that trivium process, the grammar, the input? Is it present in our world or is it absent in our world? I'd make the argument it is completely present. Not only is it completely present, it is accessible at anyone's fingertips who has the desire. And again, uh, not, the, the colors I've chosen for this presentation as a brief aside since I mentioned the concept of desire here are not just fall colors, okay? Um, <laughs> although that's a part of it. But this is about, the, the color orange resonates with the concept of desire in the occult, of wanting something, of wanting to know particularly, okay? And are we a society that truly wants to know? You know, I don't consider us a nescient society. 
When we look at the meaning of the word ignorance, coming from the Latin verb ignorare, which means to not know, even though necessary information is present, because that information has been willfully refused or, key word here, disregarded. For whatever reason. I don't want to know it. That's too difficult for me to comprehend. I have to expand my worldview in order to take that in. I've been dissuaded from looking into that. I've been told it's not important. Dissuasion and disregarding information work hand in hand with each other. So by a show of hands, how many people think we are living in a nescient society by a show of hands? Nescient society. The information that humanity needs to know is completely unavailable to us. Anybody? No one in the room. That means 100% of this crowd, at least, thinks that we are living as a entire species in a state of ignorance, in the aggregate. Of course, there are very knowledgeable individuals within humanity, but as a species in the aggregate, we are an ignorant species. We ignore that which is present, that which is all around us, that which is capable of empowering us and setting us free, but we don't want to do the work. We don't want to put the time in. We don't want to make the effort. You know, I, I, I have to laugh at people who think, you know, this is just an interest for me. It's just, it's your hobby. It's something you want to do. I, I sat in the room that I, you know, basically like a hermit, literally, in a room for years. People said, Mark, Mark, what, what, what are you doing? Why aren't you even interacting with other people? Why are you sitting in a room day after day after day after day after day? It's called reading. <laughs> and that's hard work. That's a lot of effort. That means you're going to sacrifice your time. That means you're not going to do other things, you know, because you're going to make the effort to care enough to take in what is necessary to take in to transform and then help to transform others. That's a work of a labor of love. It is a work of willpower and care, which is why most people don't want to do it. Most people are in the state, I can't be bothered. I don't have time for that. I'm too busy. I don't need to know that. I already have it figured out. I know everything I need to know to get by. That's where humanity's at, folks. So let's begin an initiation. All right, again, initiation means beginning. We're gonna look at some different schools of occultism, different occult sciences. I call them the many paths or the many ways, the many methods to the same place, to the same destination. So this section constitutes kind of a, an occult initiation about the very basic generalized concepts of some of these occult traditions. Again, time is not going to allow me to go into great depths or details, nor is this presentation intended to be uh, a very in-depth uh, introductory work. It's intended to be rudimentary for people who are just learning about this information for the first time. Occult traditions, many paths, one destination. I'll just say at the beginning of this section, and I'll kind of highlight this as we go through these traditions, ultimately, all of the esoteric traditions were designed specifically to do one thing, and that was to convey a working knowledge of natural law to the initiates of that tradition, which means a working knowledge of how the universe actually creates through the interaction with our free will decisions, with our free will decision-making processes, we are co-creating with the laws of the universe the experience that we are having, that is being generated for us, okay, as a result of those laws operating in conjunction with our free will. That's what the occult has always tried to teach people. It's, it's, see that one slide? you know, with the, the building blocks on top of each other, the trivium process resulting in what manifests in our world, that's ultimately the occult. That is the occult traditions. They were trying to teach people how the laws of nature work in conjunction with the decision-making processes of the individuals of a society. 
So let's look at a few of these traditions. Probably the oldest occult tradition on earth is shamanism. And some people don't look at it as an occult tradition. I personally do. And shamanism, like the occult in general, isn't one thing. You can get down into, you know, subsections, uh, subgroupings of shamanistic practices. You know, different practices are practiced in different regions of the world, in different cultural uh, regions, different geographic regions. In general, I feel that shamanism grew out of very, very, very ancient knowledge which was brought here from another place, ultimately. And that, this connects with my work in Cosmic Abandonment and the information I've been going through on my radio show recently. But I think the earliest shamans were working with high-level ancient knowledge and they were working with knowledge of spiritual realms and different levels of consciousness that are out of the ordinary, out of the realm of what we would consider ordinary levels of experience or consciousness. Very, it's a very internal work, but then the true shaman brings the internal work that they've done within themselves back out into the seeming external domain and applies it in their society. So as such, a shaman is a way shower. What shamanism actually is, is an ancient tradition of knowledge comprising practices that involve a practitioner reaching altered states of consciousness via diverse techniques. Some of these techniques can include music, dancing, endurance practices, endurance scenarios, extremes of temperature, or ingestion of hallucinogenic compounds, and many other techniques as well in order to encounter and interact directly with intelligences existing in, pure, in purely spiritual domains. The word shaman itself means one who sees in the dark. As a word, that's what it means. So while darkness is present all around, the shaman can still see in the darkness. He has night vision, in other words. And he's employing that for the benefit of the people around him who have difficulty seeing in that darkness. Again, as such, shamans were considered way showers of their people. Those who were capable of showing the people of their society the way out of darkness and chaos and into the light of knowledge. Shamans were those who had attained understanding of both the forces dwelling within the human psyche, which was the bulk of their work, the bulk of their practices dealt with those techniques to work with the psyche, particularly the very deeply nested and dark material of the human subconscious. But they also well worked with the forces that are inherent in nature, what I call natural law. And they used that knowledge for the benefit, for the healing, and for the uplift of their respective communities. And that's uh, the best um, definition that I could think of for explaining exactly what the practice, the set of practices that comprise shamanism is. Again, it is a diversified set of practices. It is not one thing. Shamans often employ hallucinogenic compounds, which have been called many different names uh, in different cultures and throughout different times in history. I just want to go through some of the names and break down some of the words because, you know, as we're going to get into symbolism later, words are very symbolic in many cases, and the subsections of the words that are used to comprise them coming from di different ancient languages, when we break them down etymologically and look at the etymology of the word, it tells us so much about the intended meaning of the word. So um, some of these hallucinogenic compounds that shamans have used over the centuries, uh, the natural ones, uh, some neo-shamans use these new uh, designer uh, hallucinogenic compounds, which I won't be getting into, but the three traditional ones that have been used wide in a widespread way all over the earth are cannabis in its for different forms as sativa or indica, um, different variations of hallucinogenic mushrooms that grow in every continent of the world, and um, the ayahuasca vine or uh, some of the different analogs of ayahuasca prepared often in uh, uh, South America and uh, Central America. So 
uh, ayahuasca is one of the key, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, active ingredients actually in ayahuasca is dimethyltryptamine. That's not pictured here. This is the actual mono uh, MAO inhibitor that works with dimethyltryptamine to make it orally active to comprise an ayahuasca analog on the right hand side here. That's um, mimosa hostilis root bark used by many shamans to create ayahuasca by adding a plant material that contains DMT to that and cooking it down. DMT is a, another uh, entheogenic or psychedelic compound that um, shamans have often used, or derivatives of that, or very similar uh, compounds to that, like bufotenine. But to just go back to the uh, etymology of the word, entheogen is a more modern way of looking at hallucinogens or psychedelics. It comes from the Greek, um, Greek and Latin. The Greek prefix en means within, the first part of the word. Then in the middle of the word we have theo. That comes from the Greek noun theos, which means God or divinity. And then the last part, gens, in entheogen, um, comes from the Latin verb genere, which means to create. So we put these three root words together, and entheogen means to create create or generate the divine within. It doesn't mean to become God. It means to work with and grow the spark of the divine within the individual by communing with this force that is capable of opening up an other dimensional experience within us. So you're seeing a divine realm or an otherworldly realm within the mind's eye when you commune with these uh, compounds or helper spirits. They've been called psychedelics. It's a, a much more popular word for them. That comes from the Greek noun psyche, meaning mind, and the Greek verb delun, which means to make visible or to reveal by removing a source of obscuration. Now, what have I just said there? To make visible or to reveal by removing a source of obscuration is to do what? To de-occult. Literally, the word psychedelic means to de-occult. And again, I don't advocate for the uh, irresponsible use of any of these compounds. I feel that they have a specific purpose that they can be used for to uplift human consciousness if they are worked with in a respectful way. So psychedelic literally means to reveal the mind or to de-occult aspects of the mind. These were the true sacraments of the ancient world employed by early human beings. The word sacrament comes from the Latin adjective sacrum, which means sacred or holy, and the Latin noun mens mentis, which means mind, where we get the English word mental from. Again, a sacrament is something that is capable of helping us to foster a holy mind or a sacred mindset. That's why the sacraments of the ancient world were active ones. They were active compounds that were given to the congregation or the initiates of the shamanic tradition. Now in today's religion, in the, it has become an esoteric religion, a fragment, a you know, fragmentary memory of true shamanism of the past, of the ancient world, and we now have inert sacraments that are often given to religious congregations, which don't actually provide any uh, different or mind-altering state of consciousness. S uh, sacraments or psychedelics or entheogens have also been referred to as communion. This is a religious term, of course, in, in the Christian tradition. Uh, it comes from the Latin preposition com, which means together, and the Latin verb munire, which means to build or to strengthen or to fortify or to protect. So when we look at the word tradition, etymologically, it actually means to build together. And that's what communion within a community will help you to do. It'll help you to build strength together and to come into a state of protection by understanding morality and natural law. And finally, these compounds were simply referred to, probably the best word you could refer to them as, medicines. Because they're true medicines, especially cannabis. You know, and that's something people really need to do their homework about and then spread that information to a lot of other people. 
Cannabis is one of the most potent medicines, particularly just about for curing any chronic ailment, but particularly for healing cancer of all kinds. And this is something that has been occulted from most people's view because pharmaceutical cartels, you know, they want to clean up and keep people dependent on their drugs loaded with harmful effects and side effects for their whole, the duration of their natural lives. A, a real medicine, the word medicine comes from the Latin noun medi, which means the middle, the center, or the balance point, and the Latin noun uh, sinus or kinus, which means ruin, destruction, or chaos. So when we put these together, what a medicine does is it brings balance to ruin. It brings balance to that which once was in ruin. Is that not what a true medicine is supposed to help us to achieve? To re-achieve a state of balance. In other words, to bring order to that which was in chaos. You know, and ultimately, what the shaman really worked with was knowledge. Okay, that's the most important thing that can bring balance back to a society that is in ruins or to bring order back to a society which was, which was in chaos. Knowledge is, was the ultimate medicine of the shamanic culture. Which brings me to the point, and this is going to be a pretty controversial um, point of view that I'm going to lay out here. But if you actually look into this point, you will understand that this is the case. And many people will not advocate for this position, and I will. This is something I make no bones about adv advocating for. A shamanic culture was very controlling of their young. And I don't even want to use the word control. It was very strictly guiding of their young. Let's use that expression, okay? Control takes a very negative connotation because control is often for a manipulative purpose des um, designed to bring about the desire of the person who's doing the manipulation, okay, their own selfish will. Shamanic education is something that I think people need to more deeply understand about what it was and how it was done. I talked about this a little bit at the end of my last seminar, and I uh, started to talk about it at the end of the last time I was in Connecticut last year uh, in the question and answer session. Many shamanic cultures throughout time have employed a strict system of moral education, the teaching of natural law principles for their young. In such an educational system, it is deemed unacceptable for their young not to learn the objective difference between right and wrong behavior at an early age. Again, this is something that's not even taught in our society. In any schools, in the world, anywhere in the world, are teachers really teaching the difference, the true difference between right and wrong behavior? Are we teaching morality to our children? How many parents are even doing it, let alone teachers in schools? We're sending them off to a state-run educational system that wants to teach them compliance, obedience, and make them malleable so that their minds are easily molded to whatever the state wants them to be. That's why it's called outcome-based education. Well, shamanic education can be looked at as a different form of outcome-based education because the ringer or the gauntlet that the, the shamanic culture was putting their children through was, you're going to come out the other end a moral human being, or you're not going to live in this culture. We're going to put you out into the wilderness as a result, which equals death in, the, in those societies, in the, especially the ancient versions of them. You know, in the modern world, these practices are largely dying due to there not really being any uh, shamanic cultures practically left and, you know, the rapid influx of, uh, you know, modern civilization and technology and cities, etc. We're wiping out these old shamanic cultures, the, the very few that are still left in very remote regions, pretty much only in South America and Africa and certain isolated places in, in Asia. So the small percentage of those children who proved unable or unwilling to learn such moral sensibilities during their childhood, 
may have often been ostracized from the shamanic culture upon reaching adulthood. They were recognized as the psychopathic, primarily psychopathic beings within that culture, and the shamanic culture would not tolerate their presence. They would just take them to the edge of the village, say, don't come back here. If you come back, it will be considered an act of aggression. You'll be dealt with. So the forest will deal with you. You know, and that's it. And you're on your own, and if you can survive there, that's fine. But if not, don't come, don't bring your immoral presence back into our culture. And I advocate for this methodology. <laughs> so such child rearing methods, and again, this is because I'm not saying you want to be a total domineering parent over your child. What I'm saying is you, a child is literally like a blank hard drive. Literally, and it's a hard thing for people to swallow. They don't want to accept. We largely, we come in with some inherent capabilities into this reality. But largely, largely, what we become in our adult years is the product of what goes into the individual during their childhood developmental years. And this is something that is highly unpopular for most people to hear, and they'll fight with it to their bitter death, not for it to be that way because they don't want the responsibility of having to program the young properly, to put the software into that hard drive, to lay down the operating system, to lay down the format, to lay down the operating system, and to lay down the good software without bugs into that mind. They don't want that. You know? They think it's just magically gonna work itself out or they can turn the child over to the state or God forbid, even worse, the television and magically they'll grow up fine. Well, it doesn't work that way, folks. And that's part of the problem of this whole society is we largely have a society of abandoned children running around this planet that didn't have a moral upbringing by their parents. I know I didn't. That's what led me into the dark occult. I was an ignorant child thinking I knew what was really going on in this world. And that's what pushed me right into the arms of Satanism. You know, because I didn't receive a moral upbringing at all. You know, you say, everybody can say to an extent, our parents tried to get us to be good people. It's not good enough. Yeah. Doesn't cut it. Sorry to burst your bubble. Get as offended as you want. If, if parents can't definitively teach objective knowledge of what is right and what is wrong to their young, there is absolutely no possibility of that child truly growing up as a true moral being. I didn't receive that information, that knowledge from my parents, my grandparents, or anybody else in my family. I received it from strangers who cared enough to either talk about that knowledge record it in video presentations, record it in audio presentations, or write it down in books. And that's who raised me. Strangers raised me. No one in my family, and that's largely the case in most people's family, those who do have family members who truly raise them are blessed individuals. And be thankful for those individuals in your life. What the shamanic culture, uh, just to wrap up this slide, such child rearing methods are one of the many reasons that shamanic cultures often display extremely low incidences of crime and mental illness compared with other cultures. They knew a simple principle. If garbage goes into a complex system like a computer, inevitably, invariably, garbage comes out of it. If you program a computer with a bad file system format, a bad operating system, bad software, you're not getting good output on the screen, on the printer, on the internet, or anywhere else the information goes out to. Not possible. You put good quality information and coding into that computer, you're gonna get quality out of it. And that is largely how a human being works. I'm not saying we are computers, I always make that caveat, because there's always people who say, he's getting up here and saying we're all computers. Not what I'm saying. I'm saying our Fundamental thought and behavioral processes largely work like a computer that if you put good information in to be taken in, understood, and then acted upon, then you're gonna have good output through behavior. 
If you have bad information that you've fed that to, and that goes for bad food that you're putting into the body, bad information that you're programming in through media and through the school system, etc., you can only get garbage output on the screen of life called human behavior. And this has to be deeply understood because we're not truly educating our young at all, certainly not in a moral sense. That's shamanism in general, in a nutshell. Again, I'm only going to cursorily touch on these. That's all time allows for. The Kamishan tradition, okay, this is the ancient Egyptian uh, system of moral teachings. The ancient Egyptian system of occult practices and beliefs. The Kamishan people were from Egypt, which was then called Kemet, or Kem, simply Kem. You know, you could say it was Kemet, K-M-T is how it's transliterated into English. Uh, Kem or Kemet means the black land. The word black in Egyptian is Kem. So the original name for Egypt was Kemet, there it is in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs. Kemet is derived from the word Kem, again uh, a shortening of Kemet, and the word chem means black or dark in ancient Egyptian. The term may have referred to the darkness of the soil of ancient Egypt caused by the mineral deposits left by the yearly overflow of the Nile River in the Nile Valley. The English word Egypt is derived from the Greek aigeptos, which means uh, that was the Greek word for the ancient capital city of Egypt named Memphis. And that in turn, in, uh, in turn, uh, Aigeptos, which meant Memphis in Greek, uh, the original name in Kemetian or in ancient Egyptian for M the city of Memphis was called Hutkapata by the ancient Kemetians themselves. Hutkapata means the temple of the spirit of Ptah. Ptah is one of the highest creator gods in the Egyptian pantheon of gods and goddesses. He was considered a very important creator god. He was actually considered the first and greatest of the alchemists, those from Chem, the teachers from Chem, where the word alchemist and alchemy comes from. So Ptah was considered one of the original master teachers. He is often equivalent, equivalated uh, with Thoth, with Hermes Trismegistus uh, in different occult traditions. Today, the word that modern Egyptians use for the nation of Egypt is Misr, uh, which is derived from the Hebrew name for Egypt, Mizraim. Mizraim in Hebrew means a narrow place or narrow straits probably referring to certain areas of the Nile River. But I would suggest that synchromystically, if for no other reason, um, this name, Narrow Straits, ultimately refers to the moral teachings of ancient Chem and the Chemetian tradition, because they did teach a strict set of principles regarding natural or moral law. I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to look at some of their symbolism in the um, example of the Comitian Trinity. Just like Christianity, which derived its trinity from the ancient Comitian culture, the Comitians had a trinity of gods and goddesses, uh, two gods and a goddess to be exact. This was Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris depicted there in the middle with, uh, uh, atop the pillar was the creator god of this trinity. He was the father, God the father, in other words. Uh, but what he symbolically represented in this allegorical symbolism of this trinity was the creative essence of the human being, which is the thought process, the mind. The thing that ultimately has to go to work first for anything to get created. Anything we want to create or put into manifestation has to ultimately work through the mental realm first. You want to build a computer, you want to build a, a podium, you want to build a, a home, 
yeah, you know, any piece of technology, it has to exist first in the realm of mind. It has to be thought about archetypally, the need for it, you know, its purpose. Then you have to go through the process of what you're going to do to make that happen and come into manifestation. All mental processes. So creation follows the mind, hence the mind, the thoughts, that's the, the father figure, the creator God. And that's what Osiris represented. Isis was the goddess figure in this trinity, depicted on the right. She was the divine mother, or in other words, the emotional aspects of the being, the spirit, the spirit in which we do something, our spiritual essence, the sacred feminine essence. And then when those two things come together, our cares, our desires, our spirit, combined with our mental faculties of the mind, then what happens? We act in the world. And something is generated as a result. And this was Horus. He was the male child because he represented action, the masculine principle. And he was considered the savior figure, the one that was ultimately born to redeem the world through right action. Now, right action is what's ultimately going to redeem the world. And you can only take right action if you have right knowledge about the difference between right and wrong behavior. So he represented right action, that which we do with our body. It's a sacred masculine force. Very powerful if we understand the Trinity as such, that it is just different aspects of our own consciousness, thought, emotion, and action. Again, here's more Comitian allegorical symbolism through their statues. You see the god Osiris, the creator god, in the middle. And this is representative of the mind, specifically the brain physiology. You have the left brain set on Osiris's left-hand side. Whoever made this graphic, I didn't make the colors in the background, I just found this graphic like this. The person probably already had a very good understanding that this represented the brain because they actually depicted the frequencies that often represent the left and right brain. Red usually represents the left brain uh, tendencies or capabilities and blue is usually uh, symbolic of the right brain, the intuitive and creative capacities. So if you put yourself as Osiris in this image on this statue, set the dark god of um, the, the, the dualistic uh, light, the dualistic sun uh, aspect, okay? He was the dark sun. He was the setting sun. That's why his name is Set. The word sunset comes from Set. Okay, so Horus was the rising sun, the, the, the solar disk that was coming up into power on the eastern horizon. And as such, he represents the, the positive aspects of light or the nurturing aspects of light. Okay, light coming into our presence and operating through the creative mind, operating through the right mind, through the compassionate and nurturing qualities, the sacred feminine, in, in other words. And Set kind of re represents in this image logic and the left brain mental capacities without the balance of that sacred feminine force of truth and upright action that Horus represented. As such, Set was always a mischievous character in the Egyptian uh, pantheon uh, and the Egyptian stories, you know, their, their allegorical stories. And he fought against Horus and ultimately conquers him and banishes him into the underworld where they have to do battle. And Horus has to use his willpower to conquer Set and then rise again on the eastern horizon to rejuvenate the world through light and right action. It's an allegory about knowledge and how knowledge can be used for good or ill. And if you use just pure intellect without the balance of the right brain, morality and compassion, then you're going toward a dark path. Uh, the Egyptians had no word for death, but um, in, uh, in the Comitian tradition, uh, during the uh, direction that the setting sun was setting over the western horizon, uh, they, they called, um, if you had passed on into the other, into the next realm, they called it westing. Moving to the west was their term for death. That's it. And again, that's the opposite direction of the rising sun. It's going into a place of darkness and the, a place of the unknown. And we'll look at that when we look at Freemasonic symbolism a little bit later. Another aspect of the Comitian tradition was the goddess Ma'at, perhaps one of the most powerful uh, allegorical representations uh, was Ma'at. 
she was, there was no higher god or goddess than Ma'at because she represented natural law itself. She was the law. Okay, so the goddess Ma'at represented truth, law, and justice among the Kamishan people. The purpose of coming into harmony with the teachings of Ma'at, this uh, go mother goddess figure, was to learn how to avoid self-inflicted chaos by learning the laws of morality, and thus not generating chaos for yourself by choosing wrong action. And the society would thus not generate social chaos by choosing wrong action in the aggregate as a whole culture. They would definitively, objectively know the difference between right and wrong behavior as a whole, and therefore they would embrace Mott and not go into a state of self-inflicted chaos. The Kamishans taught what is known as negative, the negative confessions of Ma'at. Uh, I call these apophatic confessions, coming from the Greek term apophysis, which means to say that which something is not. To say that which something definitively is not and has nothing to do with and is nothing like. That's the process of apophysis. I'm going, you're going to say, well, if I want to describe right action, what do I want to really convey about it? I want to say it is the opposite of action that is employed toward a harmful end. It does not create harm to another being when I take that action. That's an apophatic definition of what a right is. Okay? So there was a whole laundry list of apophatic confessions, or in other words, things that you had to say in the afterlife realm to this goddess when you went into the realm of judgment uh, upon dying that you did not do. She didn't want to know what your works were. She wanted to know what your works were not. So she wanted to look at, here's all the harmful things you could do in a life. I won't read them all. It's a whole you know, huge, uh, again, list of things. But she wanted to know, did you not engage in these things. And if you did not engage in these things, then I can say you truly were a good being, you truly understood the difference between right and wrong because you didn't do any of these wrong behaviors. Okay, this is what people want to make constant justifications for, you know, and say, oh, we don't need to know the real definitive difference between right and wrong. You know, we could just listen to somebody else or, you know, do what they're telling us to do and take it on faith. You know, to really know natural law is to know what actions we do not have a right to do because taking them is harming another being or their property, their rightful property. So what I would say in my analysis of Comitian philosophy, particularly when it came to their apophatic sense of morality, is this was the real narrow straits that we we're talking about. You know, it was a very narrow pathway that they defined morality to be. And in the story, in the allegorical story of the afterlife, when you went into the hall or chamber of Ma'at, the um, god Anubis would take the initiate or the, the dead being's heart and they would weigh it on Ma'at's scale. And this represented, did they have a light heart? Did they truly understand the difference between right and wrong? Did they try to live that way all the time? Did they not make excuses and justifications? And she would put one of the, she would put this feather depicted in her headband there, a, a blue feather, on the other end of the scale. And if the and if the um, heart outweighed the feather, that meant that the person really did not have a true understanding of morality, and their soul would kind of be recycled and have to go back and learn more spiritual lessons in another life. And if it did weigh either the same or you know, uh, not, not outweigh the feather, then um, the allegorical story was that the being had become a being of light through their knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. And allegorically, the Comitians taught that then that being would be able to go to a different star system or actually become a star and shine their light to other uh, civilizations. A ver very uh, beautiful symbolic allegory dealing with morality, specifically an apophatic variant of moral teachings. Uh, one other piece of symbolism that I used as the cover 
um, image for this seminar was the great Sphinx of Egypt, uh, who I call the guardian of the mysteries, and many other cultists have referred to as the guardian of the mysteries. Again, some people think that this was originally the image of the original alchemist Ptah, possibly having changed over the years, the visage possibly being uh, weathered away uh, by different um, uh, natural forces, particularly water. Um, a lot of revisionist Egyptologists uh, and revisionist historians have clearly demonstrated that there were uh, deluges and floodwaters in that part of the world uh, over 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago. And the Sphinx's weathering is clearly water derived. But uh, it looks like the face has been redone on the Sphinx to represent a, a modern uh, zodiacal reference of Leo um, combined with Virgo, the, fe the feminine visage of this great Sphinx. Uh, also, you could look at that as representing the feminine aspect of natural law. So really what we're looking at here is a zodiac in stone representing the rising of the sun during the uh, spring equinox at approximately 12,000 or so years ago. Let's look at the tradition of alchemy, the occult tradition known as alchemy. Again, this came out of the Egyptian tradition. So it's going to have a lot of uh, similar teachings regarding morality. And ultimately, that's what, again, to reemphasize, it's what all these traditions were about, teaching morality to their adherents teaching the difference between right and wrong, and teaching how natural law operates so we could transform from a being that is in ignorance of that knowledge to a being that is actually enlightened to that knowledge and then could practically put that knowledge into work in real life. So I call this section alchemy out of darkness and into light. Alchemy literally means from chem. Al is a prefix that means from or related to or out of. And then chem, of course, meant black in uh, ancient Egyptian and was often the name used for Egypt. So it was from darkness, out of darkness. Alchemy is an occult tradition taught through allegories. An allegory, again, is a cryptic story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted or decoded in order to reveal a hidden meaning, meaning typically a moral lesson. Again, as we were breaking down those statues in the Comitian tradition, allegorically, what lesson were they trying to communicate to people by building statues? And you'd have to know the background of the story of these gods to really be able to decode uh, you know, what the allegory is. You know, showing that statue to somebody who's never heard of Horus, Osiris, or Isis wouldn't really do much, but if you understand the verbal traditions and the written stories about those gods, then you understand what they represented and the allegory can be decoded. That's how occultism works. It works through relational and correlative thinking. So uh, the, alchemy is taught through allegory, through symbols and allegory, as many occult traditions are. In the tradition of alchemy, it is asserted that all base modes of human consciousness which are called base metals in alchemy. Again, uh, in alchemy, you're dealing with the transmutation of metals from one form into another form. But they're not really talking about metals. Okay? They're talking about qualities of human consciousness. That's what these metals are. They're modalities of consciousness. So it's taught that the base modalities of human consciousness, or base metals, are actually imperfections of pure consciousness, or what the alchemists symbolically called gold, gold consciousness. And that all metals are ordained by nature to become the perfect, quote, gold of the sun, or in other words, enlightened consciousness or enlightened beings. The alchemist then seeks to remove from his or her thoughts, emotions, and actions their disorderly imperfections or base characteristics in order to bring them to their true state of natural order, in other words, harmony with natural law, and to transmute them into, quote, alchemical gold, which again represented the purification of mind, body, and spirit. Now notice this is again an apophatic tradition. It works through a negative pathway. 
You're starting with something and you are breaking it down and removing the impurities. You're not adding something to it. You're taking away something that is already there. And this is representative of we are polluted with so much bad information, with bad programming, with beliefs that don't serve who we really are, with beliefs that don't give us an accurate understanding about how nature and the laws of consciousness work. So we need to get rid of those impurities, to, to, get, to take them away from ourselves, to break them down and to decalcify that which has become rigid and hardened. And it's, it's like ossified like bone. And that's what the hardened ego is like. And it's to break that down and to carry it away, to dissolve it and remove those impurities. Some of the symbols in the uh, symbolic um, tradition of allegory, very simple, basic, rudimentary ones. There's so many of them, you can get lost in them all. But um, there were uh, elemental forces that the alchemists wanted to convey uh, information about and basically define. And they had a symbol for them, and then they interpreted that allegorically. And here's some basic ones. The symbol of Earth, um, an inverted uh, equilateral triangle with a line going through about the uh, uh, two-thirds point if you take the measure from the base to the, to the apex. Um, the symbol of Earth represented inherent characteristics of the being, uh, their talents and resources that they may have developed or that they had a, a proclivity to or an inclination toward. Perhaps something that was um, inherent, that they maybe came in with uh, a tendency for. So air represented the intellect, and that is the pure intellect, meaning the, the left brain modality, our ability to compute, our ability to um, define things logically, our ability to break things down, analyze, etc. Water, the um, inverted triangle, represented emotion, intuition, and creativity. Again, that sacred feminine essence, dealing with largely emotion and the sacred feminine qualities. And then fire, an upward pointing triangle. Again, we've uh, seen that inverted triangle in water representing the chalice, uh, called the chalice in many older symbolic traditions. And uh, the element of fire in alchemy was the upright pointing triangle, which represented the blade, or again, a rudimentary masculine phallic symbol represented, representing action, willpower, and courage. Okay, the actual ability to create change within oneself and to go out and create change in the world. <laughs> then there was a fifth element. So you have earth, air, water, and fire, and then you had the quintessence, meaning the fifth essence. The fifth element was spirit represented by a solar wheel with eight spokes, uh, a circle and then an eight, eight spoke cross in the middle of it. This represented the divine spark or the divine essence within all of us. You know, the essence of the source or the creator, the underlying intelligence in nature, which is ultimately present in everything within nature, including us. Alchemists speak of something called prima materia, or starting matter, starting substance, is what prima materia was. Again, the starting substance is the human being that needs to be purified, that needs the impurities removed from them so that they can come to a more clear and accurate and de-occulted understanding of the laws of nature. The starting substance, or prima materia, is used at the inception of the alchemical work, the beginning. Silver is considered to be one of the starting substances. There are others, but silver is one of the main uh, sources of prima materia in alchemy. The alchemical symbol for silver is the moon, or is associated with the moon. Because silver represented in alchemy the feminine aspects of the human psyche, including the attributes of intuition, inner wisdom, compassion, open-mindedness, and contemplation. And that's what you need to begin. You need that sense of open-mindedness, of desire, of willing to learn, willing to open yourself up and receive. Okay, the truth is always out there, but we have to be open to receive it. That's a feminine quality. 
It, it's it's uh, absolutely essential and central to the tradition of Kabbalah, which we're going to talk about momentarily, which means reception. So alchemists also referred to an all-important agent which is necessary for the transmutation of, quote, base metals into, quote, gold. Or in other words, base modes of consciousness into higher forms of consciousness. This agent has been referred to as the elixir of life, the philosophical powder, and the quintessence. But by far, the most well-known name for this uh, agent of transformation was the philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone represented man himself at the beginning of the process of self-mastery. It also represented the universal spark, the divine spark or divine essence, which is present in everything that has been created and thus also in the alchemist himself. The great work of alchemical transmutation is accomplished in three phases, which I'm going to cover briefly here. They are, these three phases of transformation in alchemy are all explained allegorically. The first phase was called nigredo. Nigredo means blackening in Latin. This is a state of putrefaction, of breaking something down, corruption, dissolution, individuation, descent into matter, descent into the undifferentiated and into chaos. It represents the soul's descent into the material plane and the suffering experienced in the physical world. Alchemists often represented the soul at this stage as the element of salt. Because salt is crystallized, it's hardened, it's fixed. Just like an ego that is resistant to change. And I would suggest this is the state the world is in. We are in the state of Nigredo of blackening, of corruption, of putrefaction. And believe me, the vast, vast, vast majority of the people on this world are the salt. And I don't mean salt of the earth in the good way. They're crystallized, they're hardened, they're resistant to change and they need to be dissolved and broken down mentally, emotionally, spiritually. The second phase of alchemical transformation is albedo, which means whitening. Albedo represents the process of spiritual purification, the burning out of impurities from the salt or hardened ego. The salt in this step is reduced into quicksilver or mercury, which represents fluidity and the process of rapid mental, emotional, and spiritual change and the strengthening of the sacred feminine essence, leading to the engagement of the imagination. The only substance, the only essence from which the elixir of life or the awakened or enlightened mind can then be made. This is why the dark occult want to stamp out the human imagination, because they don't want the process of transformation to happen in our species. You know, this step is about when people start to learn the truth and are accepting of it. They have the mindset of openness and reception. Again, the date today is no accident. Highly synchromistic. 10-4. Reception. I got it. I get it. I've heard it. 10-4. Okay? <laughs> No accident, no such thing. As soon as Art suggested the date, I said, I love it. <laughs> it's all about reception, you know? So this step is the awakening process, the awakening step. It's when we recognize the world isn't what we thought it was and we start developing a desire for more than the base things in life. We start developing a desire to know the truth, the desire to reach higher realms of consciousness, the desire to better ourselves and be better than we were the day before. 
when we're going to start working upon ourselves by taking in the truth and letting go of beliefs and letting go of impurities in our thought processes and bringing our consciousness into alignment with truth and with morality. That's this step of the process. Whitening, purification, the burning out of impurities. It's a beautiful allegory if it's properly understood. The third and final phase of the alchemical, quote, great work is rubedo. Rubedo means reddening. The transmutation into gold or sulfur, uh, alchemical substances, gold or sulfur. And they represented purified and enlightened consciousness. The elemental fire of the philosopher's stone. Again, that's why it was symbolized by a red elixir. Often the philosopher's stone, often the philosopher's stone was depicted as a red stone itself. And that represented the unification of man, which was the limited being, with the divine, the divine will, often represented by a red color as well, the unlimited. So it's a paradox in terms. It's the microcosm joining with the macrocosm. It's man as the limited being in the physical domain having a spiritual learning experience here in the physical world uh, coming into union with the divine spark or essence, uh, the unlimited force in, uh, in, inherent in nature. That's alchemy in a, in a nutshell. Very simple explanation of the allegorical tradition. Again, this is rudimentary work meant to whet the appetite of the student. Let's briefly look at the hermetic tradition. A quote uh, which is an inception, uh, and I'm sorry, an inscription from the uh, ruins at the uh, Delphic Oracle in Greece. Heed these words, ye who wish to probe the depths of nature. If you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside of yourself. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. Again, it's an understanding that if you really deeply explore either of the realms of the occult, the microcosmic realm or the macrocosmic realm, they are reflections of each other. This is the correspondence principle at work. To know the self is to know the universe. To know the universe is to know the self. It's to understand the dynamic interplay between free will and natural law, an, a theme that comes up over and over and over again in occult traditions and teachings. <clears throat> and again, the hermetic tradition was also a, um, a, a growing out of, a continuation of the Comitian tradition that was practiced in, um, uh, again, later Egypt and then was passed into Greece. I'm going to read some uh, hermetic philosophy from a book known as the Kybalion. I know a lot of people debate that pronunciation and like to call it the Kybalion, but I see that as far too like uh, modern Englishized, and uh, I like to pronounce it how it probably would have been pronounced in the ancient Greek language, in which there was no like short Y sounds. You know, it would have been a long I sound, Kybalion, and every syllable would have been pronounced. Again, people can debate that. It, it, you know, it's kind of a splitting of hairs, but I prefer uh, what would have been closer to the ancient pronunciation. Uh, the Kybalion states, there is no portion of the occult teachings possessed by the world which have been so closely guarded as the fragments of the hermetic teachings which have come down to us over the tens of centuries which have elapsed since the lifetime of its great founder, Hermes Trismegistus, the, quote, scribe of the gods, again, Thoth in the Egyptian tradition, Hermes in the Greek tradition, um, in, uh, in the uh, uh, Hermetic tradition, you know, he was known as Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great one. Trismegistus means uh, great three times over, or thrice great. He was great in his thoughts, in his emotions, and in his actions. His, the, his, 
aspects of his consciousness were unified. You know, some people look at, he was the original alchemist in the Kamishan tradition, the creator god Pata. Okay? So, Hermes Trismegistus, the quote, scribe of the gods who dwelt in old Egypt in the days when the present race of men was in its infancy. And I would agree with that. Hermes was and is the great central son of occultism, whose rays have served to illumine the countless teachings which have been promulgated since his time. All the fundamental and basic teachings embedded in the esoteric teachings of every race may be traced back to Hermes Trismegistus. Even the most ancient teachings of India, he's uh, referring to the Vedas here, undoubtedly have their roots in the ancient Hermetic teachings. So the person who wrote the Kaibalion or the group of people who wrote the Kaibalion are stating that it is their belief that the Hermetic teachings are the roots of modern occultism. You know, I tend to look at um, ancient Kamishan philosophy as being even older than even the Hermetic tradition and perhaps shamanism being even more than that. We're, uh, in this section, I'm going to go for about another 15 minutes and then we're going to break for lunch. Um, more from the Kaibalion. The life work of Hermes seems to have been in the direction of planting the great seed truth which has grown and blossomed in so many strange forms, rather than to establish a school of philosophy which would dominate the world's thought. Again, he's trying to make it clear that the Hermetic tradition was a collection of teachings, a body of knowledge, not one specific dogmatic religion or one set of teachings. But nevertheless, the original truths taught by Hermes have been kept intact in their original purity by a few men in each age who, refusing great numbers of half-developed students and followers, followed the Hermetic custom and reserved their truth for the few who were ready to comprehend and master it. They're describing occultism. They hid the truth from those who did not really want it or they knew would not um, use it wisely. In other words, their modem, motto or their dictate was no pearls before swine. Okay? I see it as kind of an elitist ideology and I'll tell you why I don't agree, necessarily agree with it. They're going to you know, talk about the people who didn't agree with this approach. In the modern day, I'm certainly one of them. Now, perhaps in those times things would have been different, but I'll tell you what, with the world on the brink of collapse and chaos the way it is now, the likes of which humanity may, may never have seen the likes of the kind of chaos we're likely to see in our lifetimes, possibly, um, I don't even think some of the old hermetic teachers would have advocated secrecy in today's world. They would have advocated taking this knowledge and... Uh, propagating it as widely and as freely as possible. At least I hope so. I hope they would have taken that position. But that's the position I take anyway. Um, they followed the hermetic custom and reserved their truths, their truth for the few who were ready to comprehend and master it. From lip to ear, the truth has been handed down among the few. There have always been a few initiates in each generation in the various lands of the earth who kept alive the sacred flame of the hermetic teachings. And such have always been willing to use their lamps to relight the lesser lamps of the outside world when the light of truth grew dim and became clouded by reason of neglect and when the wicks became clogged with foreign matter. There were always a few to tend faithfully to the altar of truth upon which was kept alight the perpetual lamp of wisdom. These men have never sought popular approval nor numbers of followers. They are indifferent to these things, for they know how few there are in each generation who are ready for the truth or who would recognize it if it were presented to them. Now, I don't make any bones about that. Yeah, there's few people who are very prepared and ready to receive truth, and if it's presented to them, they're going to accept it readily. Few people are already prepared through knowledge and open-mindedness and humbleness enough to simply open up their mind and heart and receive truth. Not in this world. I know that's not how it happened for me. I suffered like, you know, I mean like, uh, you know, beating the red hot sword with the, the iron hammer 
in a forge of suffering. That's what, what got me to finally wake up and break my ego down. You know, hardcore fire of purification did it for me. But you know, I, I speak this information to try to, to explain to people you don't have to go through that process. If you will listen to wisdom and truth, then you don't have to go through that deep level of suffering. But most people seem to want it. Um, to go back to this quote, um, these teachers reserved the, quote, strong meat for men, while others furnished the, quote, milk for babes. They reserve their pearls of wisdom for the few elect who recognize their value and who wear them in their crowns instead of casting them before the materialistic vulgar swine who would trample those teachings in the mud and mix them with their disgusting mental food. But these men, but still these men have never forgotten or overlooked the original teachings of Hermes regarding the passing on of the words of truth to those ready to receive it. Their customary attitude has always been strictly in accordance with the other hermetic aphorism, quote, the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. Now, people could say, well, I have stated in the past, I'm putting out my work for the people who are ready to become teachers themselves, and they are ready to receive it. I've made no bones about the fact I can't make anybody take this information if they don't want to hear it, or if they're not interested. If that desire you know, that I symbolically represent by this orange color throughout this presentation, that, that sacred desire force that, that operates to take the person up out of the base instincts and just living, you know, for this see the world, you know, what you see is what you get type thing, never penetrating the surface, never looking any deeper, never going into the deeper realms of the human subconscious and the human mind, then I can't make them look at that. You know, there's no way to make somebody do that work because that's internal work that has to be done upon them, themselves. I can only act as an assistant to that process of transformation through providing some information and some support. But I don't agree with this elitist attitude of don't put the information out there because these people don't want to hear it, which seems to be the spirit in which this is said. Okay, um, I take the approach again of egalitarian uh, aspect or egalitarian mentality on two fronts. One, when it comes to our, all of our natural rights, we are equal under that law under that natural law, and two, I believe in egalitarianism when it comes to information being presented, information which we need, vital information which we need to make truly informed decisions in life. That information should be provided freely and openly. So I don't agree with this hermetist's attitude of don't cast pearls before swine. I'm gonna speak information to everybody. Who's ready to take it will take it, and that will be their karmic uh, choice and consequence and who ignores it will do so at their own peril. There are those who have criticized this attitude of the hermetists and who have claimed that they did not manifest the proper spirit in their policy of seclusion and reticence, and I would be one of those, and still am, regardless of the statement that comes after it, I still say I criticize that attitude and spirit. But a moment's glance back over the pages of history will show the wisdom of the, quote, masters, who knew the folly of attempting to teach the world that which it was neither ready or willing to receive. I don't think we have a choice now, folks. We're on the precipice of ruin, and it needs to be taught now regardless of who wants to hear it or receive it. At least all we could do is put it out there. Again, it's someone else's karma, it, you know, it's humanity's karma, whether they will receive it or not. The Hermetists have never sought to be martyrs and have instead sat silently aside with a pitying smile on their closed lips while the, quote, heathen raged noisily about them in their customary amusement of putting to death and torture the honest but misguided enthusiast who imagined that they could force upon a race of barbarians the truth capable of being understood only by the elect who had advanced along the path. Okay, I think you can hear the kind of elitist uh, attitude or spirit embedded in this, but I do also understand what they're saying. At certain times in history, you would have been tortured for presenting some of these truths about the reality of our world. 
And so then some uh, hermeticists took this approach of just keep your mouth closed and let the people who don't want to receive this suffer. Again, I personally do criticize that attitude, particularly in the world today. Maybe if more people would have stepped up, taught this to more people, and they would have gained the courage to teach it to a wider audience, we wouldn't have gone down the path we did as a species, namely into slavery. Another big aspect of the Hermetic principles, uh, again taught in this great little book, The Kaibalion, which I highly recommend everybody to read about the Hermetic philosophy of ancient Egypt and Greece. Uh, what, what time do we have? How much time do we have? About seven minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, the her Hermeticists taught seven basic uh, overarching operating principles in nature. The principle of mentalism, which Essentially, I've already covered that. It states anything that is going to be manifested in reality must first exist in the realm of mind. As a matter of fact, all of nature is ultimately a mental construct at the deepest level, and matter is a construct for experience and growth in consciousness. Um, as such is solidity, is matter truly physically real? It is a vibra quantum fluctuation in the vacuum. It's a holographic quantum experience that is necessary for growth and development of consciousness. So, you know, that doesn't mean I go into the full right brain imbalance mode that many New Agers and religionists take, that this is all uh, an inferior realm matter is, and we, don't, we shouldn't try to act and create any real world change here. No, that's not a state of balance, that's right brain imbalance. Balance means you have your head in the cosmos, meaning you are at, a, are at a higher level of consciousness in how you're operating and you understand that matter may be a constructural thing to prevent, uh, to uh, provide learning for the soul, but you have your feet firmly planted on the ground, anchored in the real world, taking real world action to better yourself and to help better others. So um, that's the principle of mentalism. Correspondence is the, uh, the aphorism of as above, so below or as within, so without. The microcosm reflects the macrocosm and the macrocosm reflects the microcosm. Uh, that which we do at an individual scale will become our aggregate quality of behavior at a larger scale and will become our macroscopic experience. That's the law of correspondence. The law of vibration, again, at a very low, uh, undifferentiated level, everything is simply a fluctuation or a uh, vibration, vibratory energy uh, existing in uh, you know, the, the vacuum. And nothing is truly at rest. Everything ultimately is in a state of vibration. There is no such thing as the cessation of motion or the cessation of vibration or sound. Um, the uh, principle of polarity, everything has poles to it. Everything has opposites. Everything has a um, kind of a uh, spectrum of extremes a spectrum of, uh, of polarities that uh, uh, result in two opposite extremes, ultimately operating uh, through the same thing, through the same medium, but seeming to have different extremes in their polarities. Um, the principle of rhythm, uh, everything moves in cycles uh, and has a rhythm to it, uh, has an up and down quality, an ebb and flow quality through time. The principle of cause and effect essentially is almost equivalent with natural law principles. Uh, that which we um, cause and put out into effect in the universe is then demonstrated back to us by the universe like a mirror. Okay, so we reap what we sow. That which we put out into the universe, we receive back from the universe. Um, there is no uh, effects that manifest without causal factors that precede them. And finally, the principle of gender, which states that there is a masculine and feminine quality, a blending between those two polarities in everything in nature. These principles operate in everything in the natural world, and they are always operating. As such, they were called the hermetic principles, and the word hermetic uh, comes down to us in modern English through the word hermetically sealed. It means that it's fixed, it's operating inherently in nature. And nothing we do is going to change those principles at work in nature. 
all we can do is align our consciousness to them by understanding that they do exist, that they are operating in nature, and then we can learn to live in harmony with them and not create self-inflicted suffering, just like the physical laws of dynamics. They are fixed, they are set in stone. While you are on Earth, you are operating in a 1G gravitational field. If you step off of a large building, gravity will have an effect upon the mass of your body and you will go splat. That's a fixed law, and if you, all you can really do is understand it. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, but you can understand it and therefore align your behavior not to do such a stupid thing by walking off a building in a 1G field, okay? So the laws of nature uh, ex expressed by the hermetic tradition are set in stone and hermetically sealed. And this tradition does a really good job of explaining the underlying principles of natural law. I think uh, we'll leave it there for this uh, morning session. And in uh, the second session, we will meet at exactly 2 p.m. Please come back a little bit before then. Like if you could be back around 5 of 2, that would be great. So you could take your seats and get ready. I'm going to start exactly at 2 p.m. Thank you.